You may not know this from looking at me, but I was a former child star <laughs> of Jewish retirement homes. <laughs> a few of you may recognize me from the Revit's house, others from the Hebrew home, but I doubt it. Most of my audience was halfway towards the light on the other side when I stepped into the spotlight of this world. Ah, I still remember it like it was yesterday. The adoring crowds, they would sit there, not really cheering, but drooling <laughs> on themselves, some bobbing along unrhythmically. And after the show, my fans would give me slobbery kisses. Harriet Fleshman, Moisha Dinglebaum. <laughs> I remember them all, and I hated every minute of it. See, my mother was known throughout the Washington Jewish community as Aunt Sarah and her singing puppet, Shloimi. <laughs> she cut a record with him. She set up a hotline called Dialish Shloimi at the Chabad house. And she had big dreams for her four sons, too. Little setbacks like our complete disinterest in theater, singing, or dancing, or any natural talent whatsoever was not going to stand in her way. She entertained fantasies of her boys forming a musical group and touring. She used to play videos of a group of brothers from the 40s who would travel across the country singing hits like, we just travel along, singing our song, side by side. Now, I don't want you to think that my mother was one of those stage moms, but because she wasn't. But I think she saw what she wanted to see. And in our complete failure as performers, she saw diamonds. <laughs> diamonds that just needed to be polished before they could move away onto bigger stages. She also saw a greater purpose. See, she was the child of Holocaust survivors, and she would be sticking it to Hitler for good. <laughs> we weren't just living and surviving. We were celebrating the Jewish spirit on stage. I would complain, Mom, I don't want to do this stupid, dumb, stupid, dumb, stupid show. And she would look me in the eye and say, do you know why we're doing this? Because Hitler tried to kill us and a few of us survived. <laughs> and it was hard to argue with logic like that. <laughs> As for my father, he knew what he was getting into when he married her. His job was to get out of the way. The oldest two sons were his, but by the time my younger brother and I rolled around, he had given up. He would be watching the football game, cheering on the teams with my older two brothers, while my younger brother and myself were dragged out of the house to prepare for fame. <laughs> Oy, she had such dreams for us. Some of my first memories are performing a song she wrote so people could remember our last name. We were paraded around guests and asked to sing, Deckelbaum, D-E-K-E-L-B-A-U-M, that spells Deckelbaum. <laughs> Next, my younger brother and I started modeling school. I was a cute kid, and that seemed to trump the slight obstacle of me having no ability to sit still, focus, or follow any direction. <laughs> my younger brother would be turning and twirling on the runway, and I'd be standing on my head improvising a play between a pencil and a shoe using high-pitched voices. <laughs> Next, there was tap dancing class, something I expressed no interest in outside of destructively destroying the floor with my epileptic shoes. <laughs> the apex of my childhood rise to stardom, however, was the Kishka kids. It was a crack group of neighborhood prodigies. It included neighborhood girls like Dana Goldberg and Nicole Gottlieb who loved to get on stage and belt out show tunes. My brothers and I were coerced in for a dollar each performance, which seemed like a lot of money at the time. My brother Andy escaped with the occasional wigged performance of Karma Chameleon. <laughs> My brother Mikey would come out as library shortcake. <laughs> I was the real star, though. I don't know why I was chosen. I think when I was a kid, I had curly hair, and perhaps my mother had intuition about my latent homosexuality. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. 
My most popular act in our vaudeville show for the elderly was me coming out dressed as Curly Temple. I was adorable. On the good ship, lollipop, it's a sweet trip to the candy shop where bonbons play on the sunny beach of Peppermint Bay. And then I would pretend to be an airplane. <laughs> For my big finish though, I would tap dance. And I still didn't know how to tap dance. Years later, I was showing the video to a friend and she said it looked like somebody had snatched my crutches away. <laughs> We would perform other stories, too. Tales of my mom's puppet, Shloimi, trying to build a hut out of branches for Sukkot. The quest to destroy unleavened bread in time for Passover. And the epic journey to Menorah Land to find the magic dreidel. I fought back bitterly and rebelled in my own ways. Some shows I refused to come out of the bathroom. I constantly turned my back to the audience, and I spoke into the curtain and through temper tantrums, and I upped my daily take to $5. <laughs> Finally, as I got older, less adorable, and more hairy, <laughs> the show slowed. My high-pitched voice deepened slightly to my current high-pitched voice. <laughs> <laughs> and she finally gave up. My mother became a solo act and expanded her puppet repertoire to include Nasty Norman and Shloimi's sister, Knadel. <laughs> I was relieved that I had finally worn her down. Still, part of me resented that I had been replaced by puppets. I think she privately held on to her dreams for years that I would come back to be a star. I would find some old Yiddish songbook and something would click. My inner Streisand would awaken and at that, all that latent hidden talent would finally bubble up. I think the moment it finally slipped away from her was my bar mitzvah. Everything was planned, the candle lighting, the songs, the terrible speech, and her musical interludes. But I had my one tiny victory. In between the hora and the chava nagila chava, I insisted that the DJ play my favorite song. 18 in life, you got it. 18 in life to go. Your crime is time, and it's 18 in life to go. S Skid Rose, 18 in life, <laughs> blared from the DJ speakers, and all the middle-aged Jews nervously looked around the room, <laughs> turning their eyes to the heavens and pleading to Hashem to finally end Sebastian Bach's wail. <laughs> and my mom, she finally realized that I had gone my own way. Years later, though, I did finally come back, but on my own terms. I had discovered a love of improv comedy after college and was getting ready to put on our first show at the Black Cat. I was terrified, but I invited my parents anyway. I was frantically doing shots before the show, trying to do anything I could to calm my nerves when my Jewish mother showed up. She offered me a lunch bag, explaining that there were two sandwiches inside, one had mayonnaise and one did it, and there were also two pickles. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I took it and I put it behind the stage. I wasn't going to give up my buzz. <laughs> but when we finally went up and I opened my mouth for the first time in front of a crowd in years, I finally understood what she was all about. Leon Deckelbaum.